want if you would turn in your Bibles to that reading that we had from John chapter 15. We're in the closing chapters of uh, the Gospel, and we know that these uh, chapters are just before Christ's betrayal and his arrest and his death. In some ways, they're like his last will and testament. He's making clear all he's giving to his people, to the disciples, as he leaves this world. He's making us aware of all the provision that he's made for them. Last time we saw the... It's quite some time ago, actually, but uh, a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, our last look in the book, we looked at the provision of the Holy Spirit... Uh, He is going away, and yet he's going to return in the person of the Holy Spirit. Return to the disciples by the Spirit. Not only will he come to them, but the Father also will come and dwell with them. Amazing thing that really we have the Trinity dwelling in our hearts. The Spirit, that he's the Spirit of the Father and of the Son. And the Spirit's great work is to glorify Christ, to ever exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, he's one who gives a love for his word. And the word speaks to us and shows us things as the Spirit uh, convicts us and guides us. And it's an amazing thing that God is willing to deal with us each individually through his word by the Spirit. He actually deals with us and shows us things in our own lives which uh, he would like us to overcome. We know that many can speak of the Spirit, how they believe very much that they have the Spirit and this sort of thing, and yet they don't love the Word of God. They have very little love for the Word of God. If we don't love the Word, then really we don't have the Spirit, because the Spirit delights to use the Word, and uh, it's the Spirit who wrote the Word of God. Now we know that uh, Christ often told parables, he used pictures, uh, which those around him, would especially understand. We've got uh, the parable of the sower, uh, the marriage feast, the good shepherd, many other parables that the Lord told. But a common plant, of course, in Israel was the vine. Uh, It was uh, grapes that came from the vine and wine was produced from it. And Christ now uses this. And I'd like to focus very much here on uh, the picture that we have here of the vine, the teaching concerning uh, the vine which Christ is speaking of here. It's a wonderful, it's a lovely illustration of our relationship with Christ. Lovely illustration that Christ gives us here of the relationship that we have with him. I'd like us to consider what uh, he's showing us and what the purpose is. Really, we're seeing in many ways here the purpose for which we've been saved. It's amazing that God has desired us, that the Lord has brought us into such a relationship with himself. So our title this evening is this, The Vine and His Branches. The Vine and His Branches. We've got four, sorry, we've got five points. Firstly, we're going to see that Christianity is a relationship. Secondly, we must bear fruit. Thirdly, we are dependent on Christ. Fourthly, our dependency on the Word. And fifthly, close to the vine close to the vine. Well, firstly, Christianity is a relationship. What are the marks? What we say are the defining marks of somebody who is a Christian? Well, we might say they enjoy the fellowship of God's people. They read the Bible. They obey the Bible. They come to church. They seek to worship God. They profess to love and believe on Christ and they're obedient to God's laws and God's commandments. Now all these things are what a true Christian will do and say, yet they really don't get to the heart of the matter as to what a Christian is. What marks out a true Christian? If you ask a man who his wife is, he could say, well... She cooks dinner, she looks after me, she does what I ask, and I enjoy her company. But he could be speaking about the occasional housekeeper that he has. 
the essential truth about his wife is she's married to him. He has this relationship with her. He has this unique relationship with his wife. And the essential thing you see about being a child of God is we have this relationship with Christ. All these other things are true, but the real essential thing is that we have this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is emphasized to us here by the words of Christ in John 15. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. I am the vine, you are the branches. We're united to Christ if we're a believer in this closest of relationships whereby we are the branches. We're joined to him. We're united to him. We have this intimate relationship to Christ. He is the vine. We are the branches. We're engrafted into the Lord Jesus Christ. We're united to him if we're a true child of God. Now Christ has already emphasised this really in other ways. In John chapter 6 and verse 51, he says, If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Verse 53, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now, of course, the Lord isn't here speaking about feeding on him literally, actually taking his body and his blood literally. He's talking about spiritually. Because he says, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. He's comparing his spiritual relationship with the Father to the spiritual relationship that he has with his people. But there's this emphasis there on the closeness, uh, the union that we have with Christ, because we feed upon him. We're dependent upon him, just as the vine feeds the branches. So the Lord feeds his people. He's the true and living bread. They must feed upon him spiritually. He's the true bread that comes down from heaven. It's incredible, isn't it? It's incredible. The one who made the heavens, through whom all was made. This glorious God, we've been forgiven. We've been cleansed. And yet we're in union with this God. We're brought into union with the Lord Jesus Christ. If we were able to be living in London, and perhaps we applied for a job at Buckingham Palace, and we got it, and we have to do a certain job, and perhaps sometimes we occasionally see the Queen. Imagine if we then found that after a few years, she became our personal friend, and we had a very close relationship with the Queen. We'd be amazed, wouldn't we? Well, how more, much more amazing it is that we have this closest of relationships with the one who is very God of God, the King of Kings, that we're united to him. We are grafted into the vine. We've been made partakers of this life, which is found in Christ. What an amazing thing it is. That's why Christianity is so different to every other faith or philosophy, because it's all about just rule-keeping or following a particular way. Christianity, true biblical Christianity, the true faith is about knowing this relationship with the Saviour. It's very important we emphasise this because many have reduced Christianity down to what it's not. It's just rule keeping, doing certain things. Many, perhaps the vast majority of much of the church going population today would be classed as Christians because they do go to church, they do worship God, they do seek to live moral lives and yet sadly how few know the power of the gospel and have been brought into this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Some profess to follow and love Christ, and yet they're not his, because they're not truly part of the vine. They've not been brought in. They've not been grafted into the vine. They've not become those branches. They don't have this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
They can't say they know the Lord. They can't speak of the Son of God who loved them and gave himself for them. If I were to ask you tonight, are you a Christian? Are you able to say, yes, I know the Lord Jesus Christ. I know the Lord as my Saviour. There is all my hope. There is all my joy. There is the one that I look to and I trust in. That's what a true child of God can do because they've got this sense of union with the Son, this sense of fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Christ describes some like this. Verse 6, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. I remember once having a, a creeper going up a tree, and you weren't sure if you were cutting the right branch, but eventually you knew, because once it was cut, that part of the creeper would wither and would die, because it was cut off from the life of that particular creeper. And some, you see, make professions. Some start well. They give an appearance of being in the vine, but as time goes on, they start to decline. And they become offended. And eventually, they start to go away. And they wither and they die. They bear no fruit. Because really, you see, they had no true relationship with the vine, with the Lord Jesus Christ. They'd never truly come to him in repentance and faith. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. They've come very close. They may have had some sort of spiritual experience, but they were never truly saved. And as a result, uh, they wither and they go away from the Lord because they weren't truly in the vine. So we see that there is this relationship that the true child of God has with the Lord. They're grafted into the vine, which is the Lord Jesus. And it's a wonderful description of the salvation that we have in him, to have this real and living relationship with the one who is our saviour. But secondly, the vine and his branches, the vine and his branches shows us we must bear fruit. We must bear fruit. Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, salvation is a wonderful thing. And to be a Christian is the most blessed experience that we can ever know. And we know his forgiveness, we know his love, we know his fellowship and his presence. And yet we might ask, what is the reason that God has saved us? Why is it that God has saved us? Well, we enjoy many things if we're a believer, but ultimately he saved us that we might show his glory, we might bring him glory. How do we do that? By bearing fruit. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Uh, we see this, don't we, in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Very well-known words, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Lord has saved us that we might bring forth fruits, we might bring forth these good works, that we might all the more glorify God. He wants us to glorify him. What sort of fruits does the Lord look for? What sort of fruits does the Lord want to see? Well, we know we have that description, don't we, in Galatians 5. The fruits of the Spirit are love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, many of those gifts will be demonstrated in our relationship with our fellow men, uh, with our brethren, also in our relationship with the Lords. And there are some who profess to be Christians, some who profess to be 
the Lord, and yet you see very little by way of fruit in their lives. We find that they are still ungracious. Uh, there's little by way of gentleness, little by way of self-control, little by way of patience. They're very impatient, uh, or they're, they're lacking in, in self-control. And as I say, there is this uh, lack of love, lack of love for the brethren, perhaps even a lack of joy, a lack of joy. They, they're you don't see much by way of joy in their lives. There's not these fruits that there should be. A joy in God and a joy in the purposes of God. And you may remember that uh, when Christ was on the earth, he went to look for fruit on a particular occasion and he's found none and so the tree was cursed and it withered. And we can think how really it was a picture, I believe, of Israel. They'd known so much by way of God's grace, so much by way of the kindness of God, yet there'd been so little response. They rejected Christ. In the end, the nation was cursed. We're not to be like them. We're not to be like uh, the Jews. We're to respond to the love of God. We're to seek to bear fruit to the glory of God and out of response to the love of Christ. Now, some plants can be very leafy. They produce a lot of leaf. And it's the same with the vine. If left to its own devices, it can end up producing much leaf and not much fruit. And it prospers from a good pruning. It often needs a good pruning. And Christ makes it clear that his Father prunes the branches of the vine. If you're truly in Christ, then you're going to know the Lord's pruning. Verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Of course, this isn't always the reason for every trial. There is a mystery sometimes to the trials that God brings upon us. But sometimes we don't produce the fruit that we should. And it can be we're not listening to what God is saying to us, perhaps, or we're not responding in the way that God would have us respond. And so... If we don't prune ourselves, as it were, then God may have to step in and prune us for our good. Even when we're being obedient sometimes, the Lord still prunes us. And we know a trial because he wants to deepen us spiritually. He wants us to bring forth more fruit. And you see, all those who are in the, in the vine, they know this. They know what it is to have God pruning them at times, whether they've warranted it or whether they haven't. The Lord knows what is best. The Lord knows what training is needed by those who are in the vine. Perhaps there's some trial. We've wondered why the Lord has brought it upon us. And perhaps at first it's been a very hard test and we've despaired. And yet we've realised as time has gone on and we've started to see more of what the Lord is doing. God has done us good. He's pruned us. He's chastened us. And yet it's brought forth, brought forth the wonderful spiritual fruits afterwards. Perhaps we were denied something. Perhaps we lost something. Perhaps we had to struggle with something. Stand up to something in obedience to the Lord. And what fruit followed as we knew that difficult situation, the Lord pruning us as it were, we realise he taught us greater patience, greater long-suffering, greater trusting in the Lord. We were able to show more by way of faith and trust. We were able in turn then to show more by way of gentleness to others, more by way of patience to others, more love to others. We knew a greater contentment in God. We realised more of what it meant for the Lord Jesus to suffer because we had a taste of his sufferings. We realised that what we went through at first we couldn't understand, but then we started to realise, yes, the Lord pruned us there. And we did, in the end, bring forth more fruit to his glory. More goodness, more love, as we say. These fruits came. They wouldn't have come if the Lord hadn't pruned us. And really, in many ways, his pruning shows that we are in the vine. Because he deals with us in that way. But, you know, we'll never be as fruitful as we should be. Unless... We see, we realise what the vine and the branches teaches us, thirdly, is that we are dependent on Christ. 
We're dependent on Christ. Now, apparently, vines will often have very big roots, and so they don't need much by way of artificial watering. And there is this good flow of sap flowing from the strong main stem. And the branches that are in contact with the stem, they receive a good supply. And Christ emphasizes this. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Without me you can do nothing. If we're truly to bear fruit and to bring glory to God, if we're truly to do what he wants, not what we want, in a way which truly pleases him and not just us, we must abide in Christ. We must look to him and see our absolute dependency on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, without a good supply of life from the vine, the branches are weak and vulnerable and will not thrive. And you know, really, we haven't got any strength in ourselves. Without him, we can do nothing. It's amazing sometimes to see a little baby and you put your finger in the baby's hand and the baby grips and it's amazing the strength they've got. You can almost pull them up just by that finger, by, by their hands gripping so hard. And you see, faith has a strong grip on the Lord. Faith holds hard to the Lord's hand, strongly to the Lord's hand. We realise how foolish, unwise how lacking strength we are, and yet with Christ, abiding in him, looking to Christ, we can know strength, we can know grace, and so we can bear fruit all the more. We can come through in whatever trials or difficulties we go through. We realise our need to stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be prayerful, to commit our way to him, to want his help every day. Because you see, also we see, fourthly, that the vine and the branches shows our dependency on the word. Christ's teaching here, the vine and the branches shows our dependency on the word. How can we bring forth more fruit? Well, the law and God's commandments and uh, the teaching we have in the word shows us what God desires and we must follow these. But to some extent, we can only do so much. How can we be increasingly changed so that we're able to bear fruit? Christ says, verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. This idea here of abiding in Christ and abiding in his word, knowing his word, looking to his word, and having a concern to grow in grace and finding that as we ask the Lord for that help, as we are convicted by the word and as we abide in Christ, the Lord does help us. He answers our prayers. And so all the more the Lord is glorified as we bear much fruit. It's a wonderful thing about the word of God, isn't it? Wonderful thing. Let me give you an illustration. There was a man who um, used to try and see his way and he'd use a certain lamp and it just so happens that lamp gives out ultraviolet light this particular lamp and so it wasn't only that he could see but it also as he used it gave him a tan it changed him and that's what the word does you see the word it not only enables us to see it not only shows us uh, the plan of God and the purposes of God and speaks to us and convicts us and leads us and challenges us and comforts us, but it changes us. It changes us as we read it. Christ said, the word I speak to you, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Peter, you have the words of eternal life. His word is living, it's powerful. And it changes us. We abide in Christ and abide in his words and let his word abide in us. It will change us. It gives life. It sustains us. God speaks to us. Not only does he speak, but he changes us. We find we're reading the word. We're instructed. We're lifted. We find a strength that we wouldn't know apart from the word. 
So this teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ here, it very much emphasizes our dependency not only on abiding in Christ, staying close to him, but also it emphasizes our need of the word day by day to commune with him and with him through the word that we might all the more bear fruit to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the glory of God. Do you see your dependency on the word of God? Do you realize your utter dependency upon the scriptures? Do you seek to come to the scriptures each day? It can be a battle, it can be hard, we can be very weary with work and with our young children, if we've got children and with other circumstances, and yet it's the most important thing, isn't it? That we do come to the word and so know the words, power in our hearts and in our lives. Well, fifthly, finally, the teaching of the vine and the branches emphasizes we must be close to the vine. We must be close to the vine. Really, it all flows, doesn't it, from this, the teaching that we have here of our relationship, our need of Christ, our aim each day to stay, to stay close to the Lord. We want to be guided as a people of God. We want to be strengthened. We want to be helped. We realize our dependency. We truly want to do the things that God wants us to do, which glorifies him in the way that we should. Then we realize our need to stay close to the vine, to abide in him. And therefore, as I say, we'll realize our need to stay close to the scriptures. May the, the Lord help us to realize the wonder of this relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing thing, is, isn't it, that we are actually those who are engrafted into him. We've got this union with him. As is said, sometimes he's closer to us than hands or feet. He's in our hearts. What an amazing thing. But may we be those who appreciate our need to abide in Christ and to abide in his word and to therefore bear fruit. May we have a desire to bear fruit, a zeal for the Lord, that we might all the more bear fruit to his glory, that we might overcome. Satan will do all that he can to hinder it. Satan will want to cut off the supply, as it were, if he can. He'll want to make sure that we're not abiding in Christ. He'll want to make sure that we're not abiding in the word. A thousand things may raise their heads at times to distract us away from coming to the word of God. May the Lord help us to overcome. There's a story of a soldier, you've heard this before, who was court-martialed for fraternizing with the enemy because he'd been noticed going out of the camp, going off in his own into the woods. And uh, many thought, well, he's going to consult with spies there and he's telling them about the information that we have and what we're up to. And so he's brought before a court-martial and they said, why were you going out into the woods? Why were you doing that all the time? And he said, well, I was doing it because I wanted to get alone with God and I wanted to pray. And the man who was conducting the court martial said, well, let's hear you pray now. And when they heard him pray, they realized here was a true child of God. They realized here was one who had a real experience of God. And amazingly, wonderfully, he was acquitted from that court martial. But you see his burden, his concern, even at that time, to get alone with God, to get alone with Christ, to abide in Christ, to abide in God's word. Amazing, isn't it? This God wants us. The Lord Jesus Christ wants us. He's given himself for us and he desires our fellowship. He wants to strengthen us. He wants to encourage us. He wants us to show forth the glory of God, to bring forth fruit. May we realize the wonder of this, the marvel of this, and may we therefore be those who all the more seek to be close to Christ, to abide all the more in the vine and to be those who abide in his word that we might glorify him who has loved us and saved us. For his name's sake we pray. Amen.